The next lab that you have to do in your murder mystery is a karyotype lab. And so what you see on the screen right here is a karyotype. And a karyotype is a picture of one nucleus within a somatic cell. So all somatic cells are diploid, so that would mean that every chromosome would have its homologous match to it. Notice that they are spread out in any random order, um, a lot of different sizes. And for this, because it's black and white, what you notice is that the chromosomes that are in replicated state uh, have a different banding pattern, so little different patterns of, of dark and light on the chromosomes. And what that's going to do is indicate the homologous matches. Remember that homologous chromosomes are the same size and they have the same genes on them. So that's what's going to signify that they would be the same size in this picture and the same banding pattern would recognize that they have the same genes on them. We don't uh, differentiate in these pictures based on the alleles. That would be a little too difficult to do in a black and white scenario. So what we're going to do is show you how to do a karyotype and how to kind of work that into our next lab and what your responsibility is by the time you present this data to me um, in the coming weeks. So this is an example of a karyotype and what you first notice is that um, many of them don't have anything labeled but some of them have a specific letter underneath them. So it's going to be important so let's find one of them. So for example this chromosome has a Y underneath of it, and then this chromosome over here has an X underneath it. Because of the detail that's given, we have to identify these are the sex chromosomes. Now, in these pictures, only one sex chromosome of each variation might be identified. So, for example, any male that has a, a typical male is going to have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, so the minimum is that data has to be given to identify which one is the X and which one is the Y. Notice that the Y chromosome is not shaped like a Y. That is unfortunately some, some people's misconception that Y chromosomes are named Y because they have that shape. But a Y chromosome is just the same shape as every other chromosome in a replicated state. It kind of looks like an X with the centromere being located right in the middle. So these are your sex chromosomes. It's important to identify them right off the bat because within a karyotype, they get isolated. And I'm going to show you what type of document you put these onto to, um, to kind of convey your information to another person. The rest of these chromosomes are what are known as autosomes. Autosomes are non-sex chromosomes, and males and females should typically have only two chromosomes of each autosome. And humans have 23 as their haploid number. That means that they have 22 chromosomes that are autosomes and one that is a sex chromosome. That's what would be within a gamete. That's what gets passed on to the next generation. In a diploid cell, you would have all the homologous matches of those um, autosomes. So you would have 22 pairs of autosomes. And you would have one pair of sex chromosomes. So if you are a male, Typically, you have one X and one Y in every somatic body cell in your body. A typical female will have two X chromosomes. Is that always the case? No, I'm going to show you that there are scenarios where there are abnormal numbers of chromosomes, which is what this technique is used to identify. So what we do is we look at these autosomes and we start trying to pair them up and saying, how many of these chromosomes do we have? I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm going to kind of find obvious ones. So, for example, um, if I locate this chromosome right here, that's an autosome. So that would mean it should have a match to it. Can you locate the match? Did it take you some time? But there it is. That's a homologous match. So what I'm going to do is you just go through and you start to find chromosomes that are in those matching. So this takes some time. It is a little tedious process, but if I circle that... I notice that one is there, and you start looking for, you know, just the pairs to begin with. Eventually, if this is a typical person, then what they would have is they would have a perfect match for every of every chromosome, all right? And what you start to do is to organize these onto an actual karyotype, you put them in size order. So the largest chromosomes, which you will identify this is a pretty large chromosome compared to the one that I circled in purple. So this is going to be further in the karyotype in a lower number. So here's the form that might be a typical form you fill out. So they are numbered 1, 2, 3. It goes all the way down to 22. That represents all the autosomes in that somatic cell. 
then there's a line for either two x's or an x and a y. In the case of some of these karyotypes, there will be an, a third or even missing chromosome down here, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. So what you do, oh sorry, um, what you're going to do first, I would suggest isolating the sex chromosomes. So I would go back here and I would cut this chromosome out and this chromosome out so they're kind of out of the way and they don't get distracted and being put into where the autosome should be. I would cut them out and place them right, and I'm going to hand draw that, right here for the X and for the Y. Okay? Now when you're going through, there is disorders out there where unfortunately someone has two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. If there is another X chromosome in here, it's not going to be labeled as easily as this one is because that other X chromosome will be identical to this one. So if you did a quick look through here, um, I don't see it, so it doesn't seem like this karyotype does match that particular example. But if there was another chromosome that had this same pattern, then that would be the third chromosome, and you would kind of just squeeze that in here right next to this X chromosome. It would be helpful to diagnosing your patient. That's the whole purpose of this, diagnosing patients with specific disorders. So what you then do is you start going through and matching these chromosomes up. You probably have to match all of them before you can start gluing them down, but you put them in size order. Your largest chromosomes would be paired up right next to each other, right up here. And your smallest would be all the way down here. Now notice that some of these chromosomes have an X shape, but others, sorry, I keep saying, some of them have more of a U shape or kind of horseshoe shape. It's just because the location of the centromere, the centromere on this one is right at the end of the chromosome, and that's what's called telocentric. So I'll type that. So that's a telocentric chromosome because the centromere is on the end. Chromosomes that have the, the chromosome or the centromere right in the middle, such as this circled purple one, that's what's known as a metacentric chromosome. And that's going to be important for identifying specific disorders. Since these are not numbered, you have to have some, um, you know, qualitative way of putting these into this karyotype. And I realize you're not going to get a ruler out and measure them to the literal centimeter. Um, so you just eyeball it and put them in size order. But for your lab, there are particular disorders that might arise. So for example, trisomy 13. Trisomy stands for having three chromosomes. So that would be a, a karyotype where there are two chromosomes for everything. There's only two sex chromosomes. It might be an XX or XY. But on the 13th line, you would have three chromosomes there. So since they're not numbered, people will put them in in just size order. Is it guaranteed that the chromosome that you think is chromosome 13 would be placed here? Um, if you didn't have three chromosomes, then it's not going to be guaranteed. But the other chromosomes that you can have, and I'll kind of go back to that. I know that might have been a little confusing. But there are three disorders that your karyotypes could be that are autosome trisomies. 13, 18, and 21. So you can guess that the chromosome 13 is going to be larger than 18, and 18 will be larger than 21. I don't have students that struggle with this one because chromosome 21 is a really, really small chromosome, so they would really never put it up here in the 18 range, so I don't think I'm going to have an issue. But I also get students that put trisomy chromosomes on the 22nd that's not a possible chromosome disorder. So please don't put any disorders on non-possible numbers. So if you have a disorder where you have three chromosomes, you've got to force it onto one of these three lines. So trisomy 21, again, is not really going to be the issue. I will say that the 21st chromosome is a telecentric chromosome, which it could help you, but that means that it's a horseshoe-shaped chromosome. Trisomy 18... Trisomy 18 is a metacentric chromosome. So when you get to a karyotype and you have three chromosomes and they are metacentric and they're not an X chromosome or a Y chromosome, then you can likely guess that you have a trisomy 18. So that means put it on the 18th chromosome. 
All right, it may be very similar in size to 17, but make sure if you have the disorder that it goes on one of the given disorders. So that would be trisomy 18. Or finally, trisomy 13 is another telecentric chromosome. So that means if you have three chromosomes and it's a telecentric, make sure it goes here. Again, I can warn you, and I will still get students that tend to not think of that, and they'll put them on random chromosomes based on their size order, and they think that it was more uh, suited to go on the 12th chromosome. And what you have to do is you have to talk about this disorder in your presentation, and there's no such thing or there's not known information about trisomy 12. So to help yourself, make sure that they go on one of these three. The other disorders that you could possibly have all revolve around having extra or missing sex chromosomes. These are easier to identify because the sex chromosomes are identified based on their size and shape. So that's not as much of an issue generally. Those that could possibly be um, in yours is called, sorry, Kleinfelters. Kleinfelters is a person that has two X's and a Y chromosome. So they actually have three sex chromosomes. Then we have Turner's syndrome. And Turner's syndrome is going to be one that only has an X chromosome. They only have one sex chromosome. They don't have a second X. They don't have a Y chromosome. They are born with only having one. So on this line right here, you'd, be have, a, you'd have a missing chromosome in this. You'd only have one X. Then you are going to have some typical males. Um, and they, they generally use the term typical now instead of normal to kind of be more politically correct, I guess, that to think that these individuals that have the, the typical combination of 46 chromosomes where they either have two X's or an X and a Y, they don't really use normal because that would mean these abnormal. That's not really the best way to describe, you know, these, these people are uh, out and about and we wouldn't obviously... Uh, you know, want to use derogatory terms, I think that that abnormal might give them a sense that they there is something uh, wrong overall. But so typical is a better situation, kind of says this is more often what happens. And typical, you have females that would have two X chromosomes. So there's possibly those. And then you have typical male. So these are the options of karyotypes that you will be assigned. So your data sheet, which you are given in class, has the different people in your mystery and what chromosome set you've been assigned for each of them. You've also been given evidence. The evidence tells you flat out what is the, the person or um, who left the evidence. And it might say male or female, and then it will follow up with either one of these disorders or it might say typical male or typical female. So what that says is, you have to now complete karyotypes if it says that Susan is set A. So what you would do is if your evidence was of a female, you now have to go into set A and complete a karyotype. If, um, if Bob is set B, but the evidence was for a female, we don't have to do a karyotype for Bob because Bob honestly can't be the person that did this since Bob is a male and the evidence is a female. So what you have to do is every fe if you have evidence that is a female, every female in your murder mystery that was given to you as a karyotype suspect must be completed. Even if you find that suspect in the first go around, you still have to eliminate all the other suspects. You don't want to come to the presentation with only doing the one that you know matched and then saying, well, we didn't see the other ones. In a court, that would probably not really go very well, and you would probably be... Um, forced to, to kind of prove that the other people couldn't be the suspect. You don't want to just base it on the first person that you randomly choose that has a matching karyotype. So you can imagine that there's a lot of people that have a typical female. So if you chose the first person and that female had a typical karyotype, they are the person that matched, then you, you kind of say you're convicted. I think that they would probably have a little bit of a, of a fight. Say there's a lot of other females out there that would have the same karyotype. So that's how you would do the, the second lab. Um, hopefully that helps and you'll be ready to go.